Hello and welcome back. And that's right, we've got Tom back for another video where we're going to discuss Synology. And today we're going to discuss the subject of, I've got there on my notes, Synology compatibility, because it has been something of a hot topic, some might say, um, in the last ooh, year, year and a bit since DSM 7.1 rolled out. Uh, before we go any further, though, obviously, you presumably all know who Tom is, but just in case, Tom... <laughs> Yep, as I say in my YouTube videos, Tom here from Lawrence Systems. I have a YouTube channel. I talk a lot about technology. I own a business. So a lot of the business things we do come out on the channel, and we put a lot of Synologies in. So this is a hmm. topic for sure. Um, I think it would be safe to say that, um, do you know what? You definitely have an opinion on this, because before watching this video, I watched your video on this, thinking that you were going to be, oh, well, with the enterprise sector, but you did not have that opinion. So what is your thought on, just early on the outset, Synology and compatibility. When I say those two words, what are you thinking? You know, I wish they did it better. There are certainly better ways to do this. I have directly talked to Synology and they say, we like your feedback, Tom. They commented on my video where I've talked mm -hmm. about the incompatibility. From the business standpoint, we have to roll it in there and tell people, hey, if you're going to use this NAS, and we actually have a company, um, I think they have 60 locations and we were dealing with their IT and they didn't realize that there was this problem with them that you could only use these drives. They were hoping they could just choose any drives, mm -hmm. but we had to tell them during the process, these models are all the nice rack mounted ones are going to require the Synology drives. I can tell you the benefits and I can pretend to be a salesman for Synology and mm -hmm. say, but you can update the firmware, which is not a bad thing. I do like that. That's a big plus. But the fact that I don't have an option on which drives to use mm -hmm. really bothers me because especially because they're, you know, as we mentioned, even in the last video, active backup is such an awesome thing. It's one of the things they wanted to use. So they need rack mounted, lots of storage. Each one of these locations has all these systems and they want to be able to back them all up oh, wait, we have to use a Synology drive for this model? Like, why is that? I wish there was like a, I'm an adult button I could check. Yeah. Like, I know I'm going to use a drive that is not in your compatibility list. Don't bother telling me I'm aware of this. I am aware I may not get the IOPS that you listed on your website for this system because I use a drive different than the one on your list. I am aware I don't... Um, be, I can't do firmware updates on it. I, you know, this is not uncommon for other devices we have, and it's also designed in this company to be a backup server. They wanted a fast backup server, but if it went down, they would go, okay, we can update it, we can turn it off. It's not like it's running anything that's mission critical. The backups won't happen until we turn it back on. So this isn't really a big deal. So I, I don't understand why they took such a hard stance approach on it, and it would be easier to do. We know they're just taking other drives, they run them through whatever compatibility they have and they put their sticker on top of whatever drive manufacturer. Mm. So it's not like they've taken the time to engineer better drives. They're just making a narrow list and putting a sticker on top that says Synology drive. I okay, but that doesn't I don't know if that really justifies the price increase on it. I mean, from I mean, obviously, from my point of view, I'm not uh, a hire or installer in any way, like, particularly comparative to yourselves. But I can only imagine the scenario where someone's ordering, uh, even you know, we could go crazy and go for that 60 base system or like a 24 or larger system, and they're getting those rack mounts, putting the drives inside, and then you you know you're leaving site, going, oh, that's do a job well done. Three and a half seconds into the parking lot, they're going, uh, there's a big orange red thing on screen, yeah. and one of the like. I've made a couple of videos on this. One, just doing that test of the uh, uh, f updating the firmware, because two things. One, when drives are out of the firmware, the system actually lists them as unsuitable drives to add to an existing RAID array. So when you have a system that's in a RAID degraded state, for example, say you've got you know your RAID 5, it's four or five disks, one of them's gone down, you want to reintroduce a new Synology drive, HAT5300 or whatever. If the firmware on that drive is not up to date, and you try to put it into a degraded ray to rebuild, it will warn you and say, oh, we don't advise you doing this. You should update the firmware on this drive. And it's like, well, this is catch 22, because I'll be damned if I want to power down my system right now in this degraded state and right. introduce this drive. So you're kind of forced now to use this drive, which is now being listed as unverified. Uh, and then to make matters even worse, I don't think they... Uh, they say, oh, you can update the firmware on these drives, it's great, it's convenient, and it is convenient. No one wants to pull 24 drives out of a rack mount system and then slowly stick them in a docking station next to their wanky PC on the ground, trying not to drop them in a cup of coffee. But it's it's the fact that you have to restart. So once you restart, you might have, you know, a light case scenario. You've got, a, you know, a few pathway shares that aren't being affected, but then you've got VMs, you've got your surveillance running there. You might even change some default paths in a restart that someone's set to dynamic in some shape or form. And consequently, 
it it's not i don't think it's the narrative isn't clear enough on that when it comes to those firmware updates on the drives and then worse still when i have made videos about this and i'm sure if someone hasn't already commented on this in your videos they're probably going to stick it below it's those people that have run script gone in and been able to disable that warning and they've gone oh why don't you make a video about that because if i make that video like yourself and people go oh i've got rid of that unverified status there one firmware update bang it's back phone call where are you everything's gone orange and red again so yeah it's it's a strangely yeah. hard line yeah yeah i don't understand because one of the thoughts i had on it was you know it, offlining systems we want to do this at the absolute minimum we know if there's a major version upgrade we're going to have to do it we're going to schedule that on a off peak you know holiday if we need to whatever the alignment is depending on how busy the company is where this is installed and that's its own challenge but the drive firmware updates I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen too many frequent updates of it, but it seems like, and this would be an easy solution, offline a drive during off-peak hours, so there's very little data degradation, update that drive, online that drive, re-silver the differential of it. Mm. This is something Synology can do. If a drive comes out for a little while, it doesn't take much time at all to re-silver that drive to pop it back in if there was only a minimal amount of data written. I think this process kind of rolling process, because you talk about, like you said, 24 drives, updating 24 pieces of firmware. Well, that's even you know, doing it inside this technology in an off state, that's still a lot to update. And it can be a lot of downtime mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a lot of nail biting while you're waiting for that system to come back. So I think that could be implemented better. But the biggest thing is just the let's ignore it. What is that firmware change? Look at the change notes. Is it something major? Like the incident that happened a number of years ago where those drives turned out died at a certain number of hours because there was a firmware bug that mm -hmm. once the drives reach a certain number of hours, it would just make the drive shut off. And uh, that was a... Wow, that was like five or six years ago, I think now. But I remember when those drives did it, like people, they were a lot of ones that were in Dell servers. There was no workaround. It was start replacing drives. And the problem is because all the drives roughly start at the same time. Then you're your against the clock. Line, yeah. I'm not, you're not, yeah, your whole rate array is about to fail at this many hours. End of story. So, I mean, I get it. that, But that's an incident. In the last 20 years, I can't name a series of firmware incidents with drives. Firmware on drives, I mean, there's some complexities to it, but I don't think there's so many complexities that this needs to be updated all the time. So I, I think they're going a little heavy handed on it because of that either. I can't, I don't know, maybe you can think of some uh, firmware stories, but firmware horror stories on drives mm -hmm. are not. There's tuning that may go better performance, but not like if I don't do this, I'm at risk of major data loss with the one exception of that time problem. Hmm. I mean, the only I, I can think of a handful of instances of firmware uh, advantages, as you say, but predominantly when there is a big disparity between uh, even relatively minor firmware updates, it's in SSDs because there is yep. more room to tweak within hard drives. That technology, as you say, is decades upon decades upon decades old. Any yep. improvements you make are incremental at best. But... Uh, going back to the uh, compatibility and that narrative, the other things about it that kind of there's two main standout things. One, it's the idea that I can go to compatibility listens on Synology's page. And if you are watching this Synology, I've said this enough in video, so you must know I think this. Um, but if you don't, shock horror. I don't like that you can only go up to 18 TB on their systems, even though I've tested 20s, tested 22 TBs on their systems. But it's because their hard drives only go up to 18 TB. How do I know this? Because before they released an 18 TB, you couldn't go higher than 16 TB when they only had a 16 TB drive. Um, and then you've got things like the most recent releases from them, supporting M2 NVMe storage pools, which is a huge conversation and something yeah. that Synology are kind of at the back of the queue in introducing this. And there are question marks around the architecture when we've gone in with Putty in the back end, looking at the lanes that have been opened up. Some of them uh, kind of downgraded to three times one could be a temperature thing. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. They could have done that, but it's only available with their own SSD. So I've utilized, say, uh, the 1823 XS Plus recently, uh, two M2 NVMe slots in there. That's an enterprise grade product. I can only use their SSDs, which comparatively in terms of performance and IOPS and in durability in some cases are not as good as some of the other Gen 3 SSDs in the market. I can put them inside. I can use them for caching, except obviously on the XS series, unverified, don't use it, orange, red. But when it comes to pools, it just flat out stops me. And with DSM 7.2, the beta that we've been playing around with, they enabled M2 NVMEs on three more systems, 1522, 18, uh, 16, 21, and the XS16, so another 6-bay. But even then, you can only use their drives in order to do it. And that's a really weird restriction. That's a kind of artificial upsell. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? And the same thing. I don't... 
the the fact that they're not using because once you get into some of the more enterprise level SSDs, if they were using those, I could understand it better. Um, you get a better queuing depth with them. You're going to have something that's mm. just more performant. And this is something like they're not choosing the highest end models, but they're charging me the high end model price, mm. which is kind of what bothers me. And I, I back to the like you said with the compatibility list on there. It's just not long enough. Like, how hard is it to validate a drive? You're a big company, Synology. We could do our own testing here as you've done. Like, cool, it works with these drives not on your compatibility list. They got to have more in-depth tools for testing this that they could validate it even more in-depth than a couple guys on YouTube here. Mm. So I, I don't understand why they don't put more efforts into expanding it. You would want to end all this controversy and make your product that much more popular as opposed to this being sometimes a hanging point for when someone goes, ooh, do I want to buy 60 of these units that kind of lock me into these drives? Because what if these drives aren't available five years from now and I'm four years in with a failure of a drive? Do I have to hunt one down on eBay because you didn't have one compatible? I don't know. It just feels like a weird hardware lock-in. Now, I will admit, this is something if you deal with some of the very large enterprise companies that are in the storage space. Yeah, they lock you in, but it's all part of just an agreement with them. A five-year agreement on the uh, replacement means you're not the one replacing the drives anyways. Mm -hmm. They're going to take care of any of the storage. You don't get a choice. You tell them how much storage you want. You don't get to pick the details in terms of which drive models might be used. But Synology's not participating in that market. Synology's this mid-level market where you expect a little bit more diversity and options uh, to make it very affordable and customized to your needs. Mm. I mean, when it comes, there are some elements of Synology compatibility that although aren't for everyone make a bit of sense, like so with their memory, uh, upgrading with their own memory modules, they do have a decent range of them out there. They are tested. Memory is incredibly important with you know the running of the system, some of those ECC systems as well. But when it comes to things like uh, some of their PCIe upgrades, because there are network upgrades, you know, Mellanox and some of the Intel cards out there that they yeah. just don't offer, you know, 100 gig cards, even, you know, 2550. They only, what, within the last year, released a 25 gig fiber card. Right. And... These are cards that have been readily available elsewhere for a long time. There are the 40 gig uh, Mellanux or Mellanex pronunciation aside uh, cards that have been around for quite a long time. And I hate to use the word relatively affordable and they're just not usable on there. And a lot of these systems kind of lock you out of using those. So I've always found it very, very strange about uh, the picking and choosing, particularly when you are a brand that has solutions that, you know, span quite an interesting gamut and um, selection in your portfolio of different kinds of users. You've gone, these guys, nope, you can't use uh, certain compatible products, even though they work over here. They are SATA, they'll be fine. Nope, you can't use them. But again, maybe I'm trying to think of a justification for it, really, apart from them kind of aiming up, trying to be the top of the NAS tier, but the low of um, the kind of unified storage tier. I mean, your thoughts, I have no idea how to justify it. Yeah, <laughs> it it just, I hate to say the word cash grab, but it does feel slightly like that. Um, you know, I get you want your systems to perform to the spec listed. You know, that's mm. that's always a good goal. But the reality is those specs listed, we already know, they're single VM performance IOPS. I always point that out. I said, who buys one of these to use it for a single virtual machine target? Like you're running 20 virtual machines mm -hmm. and storing it on here. Um, and that's where, you know, the rubber meets the road in terms of performance. So you already have marketing numbers that are are what they are. And those different drive models, I don't think are that much a performance difference for what Synology is usually using in there. As I said, the, a lot of their drives are just generic drives you can buy. They're not particularly, they're not like high-end SAS drives going in these for the mm -hmm. most part. They're mostly standard SATA drives and you're only going to get so much performance in there. And if your target market is that mid-market business, they're looking for the best affordable solution. And because there's other competitors in the market, um, you've talked about them on here, like QNAP, it's um Q, does QNAP have any of this weird compatibility thing going on at all? Uh, no, if anything, they've some might say too open ended sometimes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, compatibility. Well, that's for another video hint. Um, yeah. But no, when um, I think in terms of compatibility, they have a, a, a softer line on some things like their memory. Like we'd like you to use our memory. We're just looking over here, and then do what you want. You know, they're very yeah. um. And, you know, for good or for bad, for detriment or for otherwise. Um, but no, I think Synology is the only brand in that kind of, in that turnkey NAS area right. that has this positioning. But again, the, uh, there is the counter argument, of course, that they're going, oh, we want our system to perform to the spec. We want to be able to promise that they would do these things. But even then, that is a fairly tenuous argument. That's the best one I can come up with, really. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean... I 
I think for now, what do you guys think at home? Let's face it, that's what the comments are for. Maybe you've got a point that we've missed. Let us know below. But otherwise, thanks so much for joining us today, Tom. Uh, it's always good to talk about compatibility, isn't it? Um, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Um, again, find Tom, Lawrence Systems for, you know, they do everything, let's face it. Um, and uh, check out his channel. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thanks for joining us, Tom. And we'll see you guys thanks. next time.